Welcome to the Double D Trailers podcast. Uh, today we are discussing a little bit of insight on starting a business in the equestrian industry. So I'll certainly do my best to throw in my two cents worth on this. Uh, I just turned 50 this past April. And uh, let's see, I was 19 uh, when I quit college and started my own business with my dad. And uh, that's what we've been doing ever since. It initially started in farming equipment and I uh, eventually migrated to horse trailers and then manufacturing. So that's sort of uh, my background. So I've had a, a lot of experience over the years, and I'll certainly share that with you. Uh, one of the first things that you want to do if you plan to start a business is identify your niche. Okay, uh, It's so important to figure out what your passion is and what your expertise is within the industry. And it's all about solving problems or providing a solution to, you know, uh, a pain point, if you will, whether it whether you're looking at developing courses or, you know, particular hardware for horses like saddles and tack and uh, developing an online business to a consulting business, uh, to trailer hauling. I mean, there's just so many things that you can do, you know, starting a riding facility where you're boarding and teaching lessons. Uh, we've had the privilege, I've had the privilege of interviewing quite a few folks on this podcast. It's been um, just so much fun getting to meet folks and learn about their ideas and experiences. And some of those guys, I mean, they, they really have, you know, large operations, so uh, jump back through some of our previous podcasts if you haven't already. Once you identify, you know, what that niche is, you just need to do some market research. And th there's several ways to do this. You know, one of the things I looked at many years ago when we were getting into horse trailers and horse trailer manufacturing, I believe the uh, information was Deloitte. And of course, this was before we had internet or dial up in the small town that I lived in. So, you know, research was not, uh, it was a little bit more difficult than it is to, you know, to do today with the internet and what have you, but certainly uh, give some really good insight. And if memory serves me correctly at that time, there were, um, and don't quote me on this because it's been um, 30 years ago, <laughs> uh, I think there were around 9 million horses in the United States and seems like around 1 million of those in California. So, uh, and the industry has sort of been holding its own. You know, those numbers have, have gone up and have gone down over time, uh, sort of some fluctuation, but all in all, uh, maintaining very well to help the industry. You know, figure out what your unique selling proposition is. It is so important to differentiate your business from others. Uh, in my experience, when uh, I was in the farm equipment business. You know, I liked to sell products that had a really good story to go with them. Uh, for example, I sold Vermeer hay balers for many years, and uh, it was fascinating to meet the owner of the company, 2,500 employees at the, at the time back out in Pella, Iowa. And the founder of the company, just listening to his experiences of how he stumbled, if you will, into manufacturing hay balers. And uh, they have patents on you know, how to get the bale started. So they were the innovators in the industry. And it, it, was, uh, it was good to share that story with potential buyers and then explain to them you know, the benefit of what the patent was or the invention was, how it differentiated from other products and um, you know, uh, why it made a difference and it was beneficial to the person buying it. And, and same thing today with our horse trailers. You know, we have the safe tack and the safe tack reverse load. Um, uh, we do custom build to order. Everything's online. There's no, there's not any retail walk-in location. So we're certainly different and have a different approach than what some of the other uh, competitors in the market will. So identify what your 
what are you going to do to stand out? What is going to make you, uh, if I'm a buyer, what's going to attract me to you? And, and then you want to create a solid business plan. And, you know, just you want to do budgeting and forecasting. Um, really walk through the funding process because I can tell you things typically take about twice as long as what you think they will and it'll cost twice as much as what you figured that it would. So make sure that you've got some, um, you know, some flexibility in there. As far as funding, you know, it's very difficult to get business for a startup, um, particularly a small startup. So depending on what you're doing, I mean, if it's a, a scalable idea, that you can convince you know, friends and family and different ones to perhaps throw money in with you and, and take a chance. But then again, you have partnerships and you have equity to deal with. So it's certainly um, less headache, in my opinion, if you can just bootstrap it yourself. I have a lot of folks that come to me and they're like, hey, I'm interested in starting a business and doing this or that. Can you tell me how to get money for it? <sighs> I wish I could. You know, banks like to loan money to people who don't need the money. So if you really need it to get started, uh, you're probably not going to get it because banks like cash flow. And of course, it's a new business. You don't have any cash flow. They like historical data. You don't have that. You can give them all the projections in the world, but more than likely, it's going to come down to some sort of personal loan uh, that you would take out yourself in your name, maybe a home equity line on your home. But, uh, you know, don't expect to walk into the bank with a, with a you know, business venture and think that the bank's just going to roll out the red carpet for you because that's generally not the case. If it's lending on assets, uh, like a, you're going to build a, a ranch, for example, um, you know, they're going to look at the cost of the building. They're going to look at your income and figure out your debt to income ratio not counting the income that you think you're going to make from the horse property. They're just going to look at what you're doing now. So that's, uh, that's really important. Uh, there's also legal considerations. You may have licensing to deal with or permits, insurance for liability. And um, so the, the, there are a lot of legalities and exposures, if you will, that you'll just want to make sure that you know you're covered personally speaking of covering yourself there's different types of business structure so you could do a sole proprietorship it is exactly what it says it is you're working you know by yourself uh partnerships uh you can do that an llc my personal preference is an s corporation uh, i have multiple entities and each one is a, a sub s um, if it's a larger group of folks where, you know, you have a, a large board and, and that type thing and you, and you are going out to raise funding and funding rounds and, you know, raising hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars, often a C Corp works best for that. But talk to your CPA and, uh, you know, just you, you can figure out what works best for you. But you definitely want to have that corporate structure of some sort, because uh, what what would happen, you know, if you're in, uh, let's say you're in the trailer manufacturing business, and you know the trailer comes unhitched, and there's some injuries or deaths and things like that caused. Well, the first thing that the uh, the insurance companies and the person that the, the family that it happened to, they're going to go after your business. So they're going to file lawsuits on that. And they're also going to name, going to name you in that personally. Uh, that's just something that, uh, attorneys in my experience that they always do. Unfortunately, I have been sued personally before, and, uh, it was not a fun experience. You know, even though you may not have done anything, you're still going to have to spend a lot of money just to defend yourself, uh, which was the case uh, in my situation and our situation years ago. We worked through it. We came out fine. I didn't have to pay anything. But still, you know, just uh, lots of lack of sleep and things like that. So be prepared for the liability aspect and try to minimize your exposure as much as possible. Marketing and branding. 
uh, I can't stress the importance of the differentiation and having a strong brand identity. You know, when we started manufacturing back in 1997, I began going to horse shows in North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Virginia. We even ventured up to Maryland to uh, the Timonium Horse Expo and then some years later, Pennsylvania. And I remember going to those shows up in the Northeast and have my little booth set up, my trailers in there, and my flyers printed up and what have you, and my business cards and the signage and all of those things. And folks would walk around, they'd kick the tire, and they're like, double who? I've never heard of you guys. You know, where are you made? What? You know, lots of questions. And so it, it is important to create that, that strong brand identity. And I can tell you, it takes a lifetime to create a brand. Uh, brands typically don't die. Businesses come and go, but brands uh, will generally remain. So the stronger that you can do, uh, do your brand, the stronger that you can create that, the better. And you know, it does take a lifetime create, and it only takes about one day to destroy it. I just said brands last. Strong brands do, and if you protect them. But it is important for customer satisfaction because you can work so hard for so many years, build your business, build your brand, and you know, then start making a dumb business decisions, for lack of a better word, and really hurt your brand. Uh, so just keep that in mind. There's so many channels for marketing and branding today. I can tell you the uh, the competition is quite stiff. You know, even if you're whether you're doing online, or you're doing brick and mortar, or you're doing you know whatever it is on the consulting side. There's always opportunity for improvement. There's always you know ways to uh, to do things that are different than the next guy, and you know to outsmart and outmarket and all those. So uh, digital marketing is so important. Networking and partnerships, doing these shows, I can't stress enough networking and partnerships, building those relationships with other professionals in the equine industry, in the niche that you are looking, try to learn as much as possible. When you think you know everything, that's a bad thing. You can always learn. I continue to learn more stuff you know, every single day. And I always tell my team, I say, look, you never know when one introduction to someone else or uh, just a relationship or a person that you meet may open a door to change the entire trajectory of your business as well as your lifestyle. So continue to knock on those doors. Always be looking for that, looking for ideas and you know, making connections and maintaining those relationships. We have a project going right now, you know, in the, in the 3D, uh, trying to develop 3D built horse trailers and components and things like that. And we have um, uh, a mentor team established, you know, we have funding capability in place. We've not done that yet, but, you know, certainly I have the relationships and the partnerships to do that. And it's just so important to be able to lean in to other professionals, business owners that have been successful and sort of guide you along the way. Time management. Wow. When I started in business in 1993 or 94, I think is when we incorporated, but summer of 93, you know, we were when we had our retail store for half my life, many years. We would open up at 7.30 in the morning, we'd go home at 5.30 in the evening, or that's when we closed. And of course, if you open at 7.30, you have to show up at 7 or 7.15. If you close at 5.30, you're probably not going to get out until 6. And then even on Saturdays, we were open until 2. So just a lot of hours. And, you know, in my early 20s, I didn't know a whole lot. I thought I knew quite a bit, but I didn't know much of anything. And all I was focused on was growth and, and building my business. And I always, I would do everything myself until I got so busy I couldn't do it. And then I passed that task off to someone else and, you know, I'd, I would move on. And in retrospect, if I'd had more sense at the time, I would have uh, delegated and hired qualified people, very smart folks that could, you know, handle the task at hand. But... 
uh, it was a small business and we didn't really have the funds to do that. So, uh, you know, I just had to put in the hours and the years to, to get it done until we could grow that business to a point to make that happen. Uh, financial management, it's easy to get into debt. Uh, it's easy to easier to borrow money to build a building and land and things like that. Touchy feely stuff. Banks really like that. So if you default, they have some collateral, and you know they know uh, they understand that collateral. So it it is important to pay attention to cash flow. Uh, I can't stress enough. You know, profits solve every problem that you may have in business. Profit will solve that. So whatever problem that you that you're looking, uh, if you can make profit, it will solve the problem. And so just really focus on that profitability and managing those finances. Don't try to do more than what you can bite off. You know, and it's like now if you can afford, I don't know, a five million dollar home, and you're making a million bucks a year, whatever the numbers are. Um, it, it doesn't necessarily, and, and that stretches you, you know, yeah, you can make the payments and stuff, but you really don't have a lot of extra left. So be on the conservative side when it comes to business, because business fluctuate, uh, fluctuates, things happen. And, you know, we are coming out, uh, we're still dealing with some overbought territory in the horse trailer industry and the RV industry, the boat industry, the recreational vehicle industry, all the way around just from COVID. So many folks, you know, everybody was locked up. So people wanted to ride horses. They wanted to do boating. They wanted to travel in their RV. And a lot of those products, a tremendous amount were purchased. And now folks, you know, there's a lot of used stuff on the market. And so the new market is down. Uh, we were fortunate enough to, you know, have some strong years, but had we squandered all that money, you know, now that times are, are lower than what they were then, uh, we, if we, if you run out of money, you're out of business. So, um, again, can't stress enough on managing finances and be conservative. And then lastly, you just want to be able to adapt and be resilient. Uh, what you did last year has nothing to do with what you're going to do this year. We always like to look at historical data and, and make some projections, but wow. Um, and what worked yesterday definitely may not work today, and you're going to have to change some things tomorrow. So you're always having to innovate, always having to adapt, always having to grow. You know, in, in our... Um, business model where we are strictly online obviously if no one can find our website we're not going to sell anything and it takes a tremendous amount of effort and teamwork and dedicated staff uh, to keep our website in good standing you know with the search engines and, and things like that and just when you know i've been doing this uh, google search for many years now and uh, a lot of times your website is doing really well and you, you get it just right and they like it and then you wake up the next morning and half your traffic's wiped off because of some algorithm update. So you definitely have to be able to be resilient, uh, be prepared for some setbacks in your business that may not go exactly like you thought they would. And of course, as long as you have the cash to float through, uh, you can get through those times and then continue on into better times to make more money. All right. It's been a pleasure talking with you guys. Any questions? I hope you've enjoyed it. Any questions? Uh, shoot me an email, brad at doubledtrailers.com. Thanks so much.